I got so tired, uh, I had to get some assistance. So I have Garrett um, Lewick, who is one of our research fellows. Um, and uh, Garrett, you're good. Go back on the yeah, other side. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's already trying to bail from the case. <laughs> um, and then Chris Seidel is uh, um, doing the T-Lift. And then Mitch Young and Ava is here. So I asked Ava um, to come as well. So we're doing an MIS um, T-Lift. And I wanted to kind of go over some nuances uh, with, with the approach. Obviously, with time, we've already put the screws in. And typically, what I do with this is I'll put the contralateral screws in on the other side. And then, the, you know, let's say if you're doing T, uh, L5S1 T-Lift, Ava, come over, and then we'll show you guys here, is that um, you end up leaving, because you have to be able to put the T-Lift cage in, um, usually I leave the S1 screw out. Um, uh, that way it gives you access. So you can put the L5 screw in, and then you can see here we've got probably a much larger uh, uh, retractor system that we normally would, would have. And I don't know if you can see this, Jens, it's kind of dark. Um, but essentially we've done a facetectomy. Um, and then uh, Mitch is going to show you here. We have, uh, today we're using the, the um, a minimally invasive uh, screw system. This one is actually I'm very fond of because it's got threaded um, uh, 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 not only for the actually for the for the rod insertion, but also to reduce the rod. So you a lot of these systems they're not they're poorly designed because basically the companies will design the open system and add tabs on it, and that's not ideal. What you want to do is have I think threaded. Um, uh, uh, reducers inside so you can push the rod down because it's very hard as you can see you can imagine if you tried to put a reducer on top of this with the skin it's very difficult um, so this is one of my uh, go-to percutaneous systems and then Mitch uh, thank you so much so that's what we did there and now Chris is um, doing the discectomy um, and again as uh, I think JJ showed it's so difficult to do a full discectomy when you're doing it open. Um, and you can see how much of the disc space. Can you guys see that on the lateral? Hey, Rod? Yeah. May I ask you a question? Sure. So is that a striker system that you're using? This is the striker system, yeah. Does it, uh, do you have to put screws first before you put in a body? Um, no, I think you can do it, you can do it either way. I actually, um, in the past, used to do my inner body first before I put in my screws. And, uh, but you find this technique easier or uh, better? You know, I honestly, Sean, it depends if it's a grade one. You can keep going, Chris. If it's a grade two or a grade three slip, um, uh, you know, those are more difficult because it's collapsed. So the more collapsed they are, I'll tend to do the inner body first. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What do you normally do? I normally put inner body first. Yeah. And, uh, because, you know, the screw sometimes can get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's just personal preference, I guess. And how about on the contralateral? I uh, put a cage to one side and uh, put screws contralateral side and ipsilateral side too. Yeah. I use the same incision uh, that I uh, perform inner body to put a, a percutaneous screws. So now um, we're putting one of the nice expandables, um, and we can show you here. Uh, Tyler's going to go ahead and load it up. but. Um, we're putting a unilateral expandable, and then let's go ahead and dial it up. And again, I mean, I think, you know, for me, uh, <coughs> doing this minimally invasively, um, it, it's interesting. They actually, ironically, they hurt more after surgery because you're not, you're going through the muscle um, and not, you know, midline. So even though it's minimally invasive, they do have a, a, a lot more pain. But on the flip side, I do think that, um, uh, you know, the exposure, blood loss, uh, infection, those, those kind of things tend to be less. So this is the little expandable that he's putting in. And then Chris, can you, can you feel that? So you can, can you guys see that? Yeah. I think we're getting into end plates, so I'm gonna stop. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of in a five minute demonstration what what we did there. Um, the other thing I think what 
uh, is difficult to do with minimally invasively, obviously, is to get the contralateral, you know, to try to decompress it. You, usually in these cases, the patients will have some element of uh, stenosis, whether that's foraminal or central. And so I, I have a difficult time. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll angle our tube, yep. right, Chris? Right. And we'll try to go all the way across to the other side. But still, if you know, if you look at the post-op X-ray, um, you'll see that there's still that lateral recess. So that's one of the challenging parts. And then, again, um, you know, uh, also burring out the facet joint, getting uh, uh, good fusion. So let's go ahead and get a quick. Um, you feel good about that, Chris? Yeah, I feel good. Hey, Rod. Before so let's you... go ahead. Before we take the cage out, let's go ahead and get an AP. Hey, Rod. And yeah, sorry. I think actually we missed probably the most important part of the procedure first. That that's really approach. So when you do the approach, do you take out the entire facet, lateral and medial, or uh, do you leave some of the uh, uh, lateral facet intact? For the the side that I'm doing the T lift on, mm -hmm. I usually take out the entire facet. The whole you thing. Re you really don't have a lot of room. Okay. How about you? Yeah, I take out the whole thing, but uh, yeah. when you take out the facet, do you use a microscope? Yeah, so uh, a microscope on all these cases. Okay. Because it's the, you know, the, the lighting, the, at least the, the tube system I use doesn't have any lighting in it. So let's go ahead and get a shot there. Great. So you can see, I mean, we got a pretty big cage. In there, it's midline, and then now what I would do is um, take out the inserter and then put in the um, put in the S1 screw. Yeah. Any other questions? That was a five-minute T lift for you guys. Hey, uh, Rod. Yeah. So are you uh, using a microscope because of the lighting, not because of the magnification? Is that right? Um, no, both, because okay. otherwise, I mean, I, I just, I use microscope for my, even for my decompressions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think you just get, I, you can see everything so nicely. Yeah, for the people who do not want to use a microscope, probably an option is there's some uh, attachment of the light and you can put it on top of the retractor. And uh, if you like to use a loop along with the light sources, that'll be an alternative option. So. You don't have to crowd the That's OR right. with the microscope and the C arm. Great. Any other? Chris Chris has done a bunch of these with me. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I love this procedure. It's definitely something yeah. I'm going to adopt in my practice. So. So, and, Rod, great questions by, and that was nicely done, uh, uh, great points by Sean. Um, you have been one of the co-creators of uh, Professor Souk's uh, renamed IDO, Interdisc Osteotomy. If you're very honest, is there a, um, a similar ability to re-expand a collapsed anterior disc space from this unilateral approach? Uh, where do you see the pros and cons of this kind of a unilateral MIS approach versus a regular midline IDO? <laughs> You know, honestly, um, I think there is. In fact, I just uh, did a, um, uh, a couple cases where we did it, and I think you can do an IDO for cutaneously. And there's uh, uh, several of my colleagues around the country now that are doing this, um, you know, minimally invasively. Yeah, because so, Joel Kim, Joel Kim showed yeah, us how to do an IDO. It. We've done a couple, and um, it's pretty impressive. Um, the only thing I have to say, which is you know a little bit different, it's trying to get that posterior wall, um, which we which we do with IDOs, is trying to get that posterior wall off because you're so far lateral. Um, but doing a bilateral approach, I think um, uh, there definitely uh, is an opportunity to really realign the spine. So. That's very elegant. Uh, thank you so Great. much. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, come on back over here again and help us close out this course. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Great assistance. John, give me a big picture thing. And uh, JJ, you're in a competitive market also. Um, MIS, paraspinal incisions. I mean, it's as if uh, Leon Wiltsey has come back again and basically told us the only way to approach an elective lumbar spine is through the paraspinal muscles. Is that the new standard, or can we still do like somebody here uh, in good conscience a midline exposure? 
Well, my personal opinion is I think there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, and I think that it depends on the patient and their age and the, their pathology and everything. I mean, I just think there's a lot of younger patients that are thin, for example, that MIS works fine because they've got a high rate of fusion. You know, I think older patients, um, you might get into a little bit of trouble doing MI, just like doing opening on everybody, open isn't necessary. I think doing MIS on everybody probably isn't warranted either. So it just really depends on the, we don't have a lot of, um, MIS in our region has a somewhat bad reputation because there's been a lot of people that haven't done it well. And so people come in with incisions this long on each side of their yeah. spine for a single level fusion. Yeah and cages that are put in cattywampus that are up against nerve roots and they have non-unions because the cage rattles around because it just does well. And so, you know, learning how to do MIS well is, is, a, is a long process. It takes years in many cases to do that. And, and so it, it has a little bit of a bad name because we probably do maybe 25 between all of us redos of MIS surgeons in the, in the region. So it just depends. JJ, you're in bathing suit country, SoCal, high high value, um, high competition arena. What's the reality for you in one or two level lumbar fusion surgeries? Is it MIS, paraspinal? Can you still do posterior midline incisions? No, as, as, look, here's microphone. the bottom line. What are you? What are, your success is what? It always be your patient selection, regardless of what we do. It's patient selection every time, right? So I like John. Um, and my patients at least, um, they'll say whatever you, do, however you feel comfortable doing it, they trust you to do the best for them. So they want that outcome and it's almost regardless of how you do it or how you get there. It, they depend on you for that. I get very few people coming in demanding a robot, demanding this, demanding that, oh, you don't do that? I'm out of here. Um, it's only like, and again, I think it was too much sun on their head, the ones that um, come in and demanding um, kind of alternative uh, things like genetic and, and plasma injections and things like that. that. Those are just a waste of time. But most mainstream patients will come in based on your reputation and will trust what you do. And it's in your hands, whether I do it best MIS, whether I do it best open, so be it. From my standpoint, from what I've seen, and Cho Kim's, I love Cho, don't get me wrong, but I see a lot of Cho's, and I see all those scars, and I see all those incisions. People aren't happy with those multiple puncture wounds. They would rather have that midline that heals relatively well, and if you do a subcuticular stitch, at the end, you know, you have to come up to see it. So, um, yeah, I think the incisions from MIS, especially from multiple scars, when, first of all, when you add them up, they're probably equivalent to one midline. Um, and number two, they don't heal as well as a midline scar. So and, that's the way I feel. I and think they're you difficult do your to best. revise. And what? And they're difficult to revise, the skin bridge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. My experience, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm biased, but uh, my experience has been different. And I, that is true, the APR altos, multiple uh, stab incisions, is kind of just as long. It could be even longer than the midline incision. But uh, one big advantage is there's no muscle dissection. So when I make those little puncture wounds, I don't cut any of those muscles. And I put my peon in there, I split everything. So, uh, you know, again, the less well, muscle trauma, I think, is a bigger advantage. Not everybody that way. <laughs> yeah, we don't, right. We don't cut yeah. muscles, right? We do subperio, and I do MIS, but mm. when you do a midline, you're, you're stripping the muscle. You're not going, cutting muscle. Yes, when you get to, you know, and when I do MIS, look, you're going to injure the multifidus muscles. I, you know, it's going to happen. You are going to create some scar. You're going to leave a hematoma behind. And if you look at the long-term studies, right, they're equivalent. The advantage of MIS is upfront, right? But long-term, they do just as well. The bottom line is, it's whatever you better do equivalently from an MIS procedure, what you would do from an open. And that's just it. Whatever you're comfortable doing, that's what you should do. 
Period. Yeah. So we have three older surgeons here uh, <clears throat> and some younger surgeons. Ganesh, I'll put it on you. You're, again, hyper competitive market, not so much bathing suit area, but there are multiple major name medical schools in closest proximity. As a young surgeon, where do you see the pressures? Where do you see the answer in terms of to solve one or two level lumbar fusions? Yeah, you know, I, that's, it's actually a really key point. And I think one thing that is common amongst all of us, regardless of what stage we're at, is that we all need to continue to evolve and uh, adopt and uh, continue to assess not only the literature, but really be very critical of our outcomes. And I will tell you, nothing was more humbling than having to put together my oral boards cases and seeing actually how patients were doing postoperatively. And um, that's one way to quickly get humbled in terms of really seeing the impact we have as surgeons on patients' lives. Um, uh, it's not always just about what we do technically. Um, and so part of that is learning to adopt techniques and approaches that maybe we weren't familiar with. Um, and uh, that will allow us to provide the best solution for that specific patient. And whether that means it's MIS or open or lateral or anterior perk screws, it, it open uh, TLIF, MIS TLIF, it's really about customizing an approach that we feel would be best optimized for that specific patient. So where I am in my arc is that um, you know I, I'm continuing to develop and uh, learn new techniques. I didn't do a lot of lateral lumbar inner body fusions when I was training as a resident or as a fellow, but now it's like I would say about anywhere from five to 10% of my overall case mix. And it's been a very powerful adjunct to what I can offer patients who either present with coronal imbalances or um, uh, are looking for an MIS-based approach to improve foraminal height, especially if they've had a prior decompression. And so I think, you know, it's continuing to evolve um, regardless of the market we're in. I think it's just about being able to be humble enough and also continue to learn to uh, adopt new technology so that we can offer best, uh, the best customized solutions for our patients. Sean. I just want to make one comment. I think the worrisome trend nowadays uh, with the MIS and uh, technology advancement, people just don't know how to do the surgery without the machine. And uh, I know actually personally many surgeons who are well known in their community, they can do a surgery without navigation. And nowadays uh, with the uh, propagation of the robot, now pretty soon we're going to have a lot of surgeons who can't even put a pedicle screws. And uh, you know, I think it is important that we first learn the basics first and then learn how to do the open procedure well. Then if you're so inclined, uh, you should move into the MIS and uh, to make things more uh, you know, convenient, you can you know, okay. list the uh, help of the machine. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, the new surgeons that's being trained, they come in and uh, they'll say, well, do you have a navigation? If you don't have it, I can't come to your hospital because I don't know how to do the surgery without navigation. And I think that's worrisome. And I'd add to that, if you're going to do a new procedure, please go spend some time with somebody and for a week or two and learn how to do it with a surgeon that does it all the time as an externship, so to speak, even as an attending. Don't take a, cor a corporate class. It's not long enough and intensive enough to really make you an expert to do it. I 100% agree. Four o'clock, Rod. Thanks so much uh, to all the amazing faculty and uh, our sponsors um, and Seattle Science Foundation. We couldn't do it without you, Jens. So special uh, recognition, first of all, for our corporate sponsors, Globus, Alpha Tech Spine, Serapedics, Orthofix C-Spine, Stryker, Biocomposites, and Medtronic. We can't do this without you. We don't get any riches out of this. This is uh, truly a international uh, event, and uh, it's possible through you. The extraordinary efforts of our uh, faculty, and I want to specifically point out our visiting faculty, Jean-Jacques Abitbol, uh, John Daimar, and Ganesh Shankar are very much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> and Michael Feelings, Vincent Arlet, uh, Michael Wong, and Michael Jansen all contributed heavily. And we obviously have our major influence, as we've discovered. John Daimar and I share that, and we all have so much to thank him for. Uh, Jean Dubusset, and we have a recorded lecture because he was not feeling well enough to travel. And we encourage you to watch this right in the conclusion of this course. We hope, and uh, many thanks to our over 500 views on YouTube, live, and other social media platforms for joining us today. We hope you found merit in this and uh, spread the wonderful uh, lab demos and lectures that you've seen. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one. Rod, any closing sentences? Uh, see you guys next year. Right. Thank you. Short and sweet.
Thank you.